Ashley Brock, reading Nora Roberts' book, Sea Swept, Chapter 16. Jerome was an Ethan strong suit. With the other boats he built, he'd worked off very rough sketches and detailed measurements. For the first boat for this client, he fashioned a loafing, lofting platform, and he had found working from it was easier and more precise. The skiff he built and sold had been a basic model, with a few tweaks of his own added. He'd been able to see the completed project in his mind easily enough, had no trouble envisioning inside or interior views, but he understood that the beginnings of a business required all the forms Philip had told him to sign. He needed something more formal, more professional. They would want to develop a reputation for skill and quality quickly. They expected to stay afloat. So he spent countless hours in the evening at his desk struggling over the blueprints and drawings of their first job. When he wrote his completed sketches on the kitchen table, he was both pleased and proud of himself. This, he said, holding down the top corners is what I had in mind. Cam looked over his east and shoulder. Sip the beer he just opened, grunted. I guess that's supposed to be a boat. Insulted, but not particularly surprised by the comedy. I'd like to see you do better, Rembrandt. Cam shrugged, sat upon closer, more neutral study. He admitted he couldn't, but that didn't make the drawing of the slope look any more like a boat. I guess it doesn't matter much as long as we don't show your art project to the client. He pushed the sketch aside and got down to the blueprints. Here, Ethan's thoughtful precision and patience showed through. Okay, now we're talking. You want to go with smooth lap construction? It's expensive, Ethan again, but it's got advantages. He'll have a strong, fast boat when we're finished. I've been in on, I've been in on a few who came over. You've got to be good at it. We'll be good at it. Cam had a yeah. Thing is, as a matter of pride, Ethan knows the schedule of the completed boat back over. It takes skill and precision to smooth lap a boat. Anybody who knows boats recognizes that. This guy, he's a Sunday sailor. Does no more than basic port and starboard. He's just got money. But he hangs with people who knows boats. And so we use him to build a rep. Can't finish. Good thinking. He studied the figures. The drawing. The views. It, should, it would be a honey, he mused. All they had to do was build it. We could build a life model. A live model. We could. But a live model it was an old and respected stage of boat building. Boards of equal thickness would be pegged together and shaped to the desired hull form. The model could be taken apart so that the shape of the mold frames could be determined. Then the builders would trace the shape of the planks or lifts in their proper relation to one another. We could start the lofting. Can't use. I figured we could start work on that tonight and continue tomorrow. That meant drawing the full-size shape of the hull on a platform in the shop. It would be detailed, showing the mold sections, and those sections would be tested by John in the longitudinal curves, water lines. Yeah, why wait? Cam glanced up as Seth wandered in the raid the refrigerator, though it would be better if we had somebody who could draw worth diddly. He said casually and pretended not to notice a sudden interest. As long as we have the measurements in the works first class, it doesn't matter. To fit in his work, he just moved the hand over his rendering of the boat. It was being nicer if we could show, show the client something jazzy. Cam lifted his shoulder. Philip would call it marketing. I don't care what Philip would call it. The stubborn line began to form between Ethan's eyebrows. Sure sign that he was about to dig in his heels. The client's, the client's satisfied with my work, and he's not going to be critiquing a drawing. It was a damn boat on a picture for his wall. I was just thinking. Cam let it hang as Ethan, obviously irritated, rose to get his own beer. Lots of times in the boat yards I've known, people come around and hang out. They like to watch boats being built. Especially the people who don't know squat about boat building, but think they do. You could pick up customers that way. So? He's a pop the top of the I don't care if people want to watch his rampaging laps. He did, of course, but he didn't accept, expect it would come to that. It'd be interesting. I was thinking if we had good frame sketches on the walls, boats we've built. We haven't built any damn boats yet. Your skipjack, can't point out, the work boat, the one you already did for our first client, and I put in a lot of time on two mastered schooners up in Maine, in Maine a few years ago. A snazzy little skiff in Bristol. Ethan Sipkin gets her. Maybe it would look good, 
but I'm not voting to hire some artist to paint pictures. We've got an equipment list to work out, and Phil's got to finish fiddling with a contract for this boat. There's the thought. Cam turned. Seth was standing in front of the wide open fisherman. Want a menu, kid? Seth jolted and grabbed the first thing that came out to him. A carton of blueberry yogurt was the one he had in mind for a snack, but he was too embarrassed to put it back. That was what he considered Philip's health scrap. He got out of spoon. Uh, I got stuff to do. He muttered and hurried out. Ten bucks as he feeds that to the dog. Camp said lightly, wondering how long it would take Seth to start drawing boats. He had a detailed and somewhat romantic sketch of Ethan Skipjack down by morning. He didn't need Philip's present in the kitchen to remind him it was Friday, the day before freedom. Ethan was already gone, sailing out to check crab pots and rebate. Though Seth had tried to plot how to catch all three of them together, he simply hadn't been able to figure out how to delay Ethan's dawn departure. But two out of the three, he thought, as he passed the table, where Cam was brooding silently over his morning coffee, wasn't bad. Took at least two cups of coffee before any man in the Quinn household communicated with more than grunts. Seth was already used to that, so he said nothing as he sat down his backpack. He had a sketchbook with his finger wedged between the pages. He dropped it on the table as if it didn't matter to him in the least. Then, with his heart skipped, rummaged through the cupboards for cereal. Cam saw the sketch immediately, smiling into his coffee. He said nothing. He was considering the toasts he'd managed to burn when Seth came to the table with a box and a bowl. The damn toaster's defective. He turned it up too high again. Philip told him and finished beating his egg whites in chive omelet. I don't think so. How many eggs are you scrambling there? I'm not scrambling any. Philip slid the eggs into the omelet pan he brought from his own kitchen. Make your own. Jeez, was the guy blind or what? Seth wondered. Poured milk on a seal and gently nudged the sketchbook and it's closer to Cam. Wouldn't kill you to add a couple more. Why well, don't it? Cam broke off a piece of charcoal toast. He had almost learned to like it that way. I made the coffee. The sludge? Bill corrected. Let's not get delusional of Grand Deer. It's Cam sighed lustfully. Then rose to get a bowl. He picked up the cereal box and sat beside Seth's open sketchbook. He could already hear the boy, boy grind out his teeth, sat back down for it. Probably going to have company this weekend. Philip concentrated on Brown and the omelet for, to perfection. Who? Anna. Cam slopped milk into his bowl. I'm going to take her sailing, and I think I've got her talked into cooking dinner. All the guy could think about was girls and fill in his gut, set the side and in disgust. He used his elbow to show sketch pad closer. Cam never glanced up from a cereal bowl. We saw Philip slide the omelet from the plan to the plate. He chose it time to make his move. Seth's face was studying agony and he seemed fury. What was this? Cam said absently, cocking his head to view the sketch that was by <laughs> was by now all but under his nose. Seth nearly rolled his eyes. It was about the same time. Nothing. He muttered and gloomily kept eating. Looks like Ethan's boat. Cam picked up his coffee, Lansville. Doesn't it? Philip stood, sampling the first bite of his breakfast primitive. Yeah. It's a good drawing. Curious, he looks at You knew it? I was just fooling around. Flush of pride was creeping up his neck and leaving his stomach jury. I work with guys who can't draw this well. Philip saw Seth and absent. Philip gave Seth an absent pat on the shoulder. Nice work. No big deal. I said a shark as the throw burst through. Funny. Ethan and I were just talking about using catches of boats in the boat yard. You know, Phil, like advertising our work. Phil, Phil Lip settled down to his eggs, but put to the bro in both surprise and approval. He thought of that. Call me a maze. Good idea. He's got, he studied the sketch more closely as he worked it through. Frame it rough. Keep the edges of the sketch raw. Should look working man, not fancy. Can't make a sound on his throat. He were mulling it over. One sketch won't make much of a statement, Brown says. I guess you couldn't do a few more. Like if Ethan's work boat, or if I got some pictures of a couple of those boats I've worked on. I don't know. Seth's about to keep the excitement out of his voice. Nearly succeeded in keeping his eyes bored when they met Cam's, but a little lights of pleasure dance in them. Maybe. It'd take Phil long to clue in. Catching the drift, he reached for his coffee knock. Could make a nice statement. Clients who came in would see different boats we've done. It'd be good to have a drawing of the one you're starting on. Cam snorted. Ethan's got a pathetic sketch. Looks like a kindergarten project. Don't know what can be done about it. He looked at Seth and narrowed his eyes. Maybe you can take a look at it. Seth felt laughter bubbling up in his throat and gamely swallowed. 
I suppose. Great. You got about 90 seconds to make the bus, kid. Or you're walking to school. Shit! Seth scrambled up, grabbed his backpack, and took off in a flurry of pounding sneakers. On the front door, slammed field was set back. Nice work, Cam. I have my moments. Every now and again. How'd you know the kid could draw? He gave Anna a picture he done of the pup. Hmm. So what's the deal with her? Deal? Cam went back to his pitiful toast and tried not to envy Philip's sakes. Spending the weekend sailing, cooking dinner. I haven't seen you sniffing around any other woman since she came on the scene. Philip grinned in his coffee. Sounds serious. Almost domestic. Get a grip. Cam's stomach took an uncomfortable little lurch. We're just enjoying each other. I don't know. She looks like the pick a fence type to me. Cam's sort of career woman. She's smart. She's ambitious. She's not looking for complications. She wanted a house in the country. I can't remember. Near the water. Or the yard. Where she could plant flowers. Women always look for complications. Phil said positively. Better watch your step. I know where I'm going. And how to get there. That's what they all say. Anna was doing her best not to look for or find complications. It was one of the reasons she decided against seeing Cameron on Friday night. She made work her excuse, compromised by telling him she'd be at his house bright and early Saturday morning for a sale. When he willed, she'd weakened and promised to make lasagna. When he willed, she weakened and promised to make lasagna. The part of her that gained so much pleasure from watching others eat, what she prepared herself came from her grandmother. Anna believed that was something to be proud of. Though she didn't commit to spending the night, they both realized it was understood. She took the evening for herself, changed out of her suit and into baggy sweats. She put some of her favorite music on. Nestling Billy Holiday between Verna and Cream, she poured a glass of good red wine and watched the sunset. It was time, she knew, long past time, to do some clear thinking, some objective analyzing. She knew Cameron Quinn only a matter of weeks, yet she'd allowed herself to become more involved with him than with any other man who touched her life. This level of involvement hadn't been in her plans. She usually planned so well. Steps she took, both professionally and personally, were always carefully thought out. She knew that was a protective action, one she had decided upon coolly at an early age. If she thought about where each step was leading, or could lead, held back on impulse, and depended on intellect, it was much harder to make a mistake. She felt she made too many mistakes years before. If she had continued along the path she blindly raced down after losing her innocence and her mother, she would have been doomed. She had to learn not to blame herself for the things she had done during that dark part of her life, not to wallow in guilt for the hurt she caused the people who loved her. Guilt was a negative emotion. Anna preferred positive actions, results, direction. What she had chosen and accomplished had been for for her grandparents, for her mother, and for the terrified child curled on the side of a dark road. Taking time, a long healing time, for it came to her that while she lost her mother, her grandparents had lost their only child. A daughter they loved. Despite their grief, they opened their home to Anna. Despite her destructive actions, their hearts never faltered. Eventually, she learned to accept the loss, the horror she experienced. More, she learned to accept that everything she had done for the two years following that night was a result of a wounded soul. She was fortunate to have people love her enough to help her heal. When she found her way again, she promised herself that she would never be reckless again. Impulse was safe for foolish things, spending sprees, long, fast drives to nowhere. They had been so important to her that she remained basically, practically motivated and rational that she had buried the reckless bit of her heart. Now, she thought, it was the same heart that had led her to this. Loving Cameron Quinn was ridiculously reckless, and she knew what was going to cost her, but her emotions were her own responsibility. She decided that was something she had to learn the hard way. She would handle them, and she would survive them, but it was just an, so odd, she admitted, and leaned against the open patio door to catch the early evening breeze. She always believed that if she ever experienced love, she would be aware of every stage of it. She hoped to enjoy it, the gradual slide she imagined, the mutual awareness of deepening feelings. But there had been no gradual slide, no gentle fall with Cam. It was one fast, hard tumble. One moment, she felt attraction, interest, enjoyment. Then it seemed she no more than blinked before she was heading headlong in love. She imagined it would scare him to death as he was racing for the hills. The image made her laugh a little. They were like, they were well matched there. She decided she would like to do some fast running in the opposite direction herself. She'd been prepared for an air affair, but far from ready for a love affair. 
So analyzed, she ordered herself, what was it about him that made the difference? His looks, on a little hum of pleasure, she closed her eyes. There was little doubt that what had gained her attention intentionally, what woman wouldn't look twice, then look again at those dangerous, dark looks, the restless, still-colored eyes, the firm mouth, those equally appealing, and a grand or a His body was a perfect female fantasy of tough muscles, rough hands, and lean lines. Naturally, she'd been attracted, and his quick mind had intrigued her, so had his arrogance, she admitted, though it was a lower thought, a lowering thought, but it was his heart that had changed everything. Oh, she hadn't expected that generous heart, reckless, generous. He had so much to give and was so unaware of it. He thought himself selfish, hard but hard bitten, even cold. She imagined he could be, but where it counted most, he was warm and giving. She didn't think he was fully aware of how much he was offering Seth or how their relationship was changing. She sincerely doubted he fully understand that he loved the boy. And Anna realized it was the bl that blind spot came to his own goodness that had undone her. She supposed when it came down to it, falling in love with him had actually been sensible. Staying in love with him would be disastrous. She, she should have to work on that. The phone rang, distracting her, carrying her wine. She walked back in and picked up the portable on the coffee table. Hello? Miss Benelli, working? She couldn't stop the smile. Working something out, yes? An air uh, soared out of her stereo as she sat down, propped her feet on the coffee table. You? Ethan and I have a little something we're fiddling with tonight yet, then I'm not even going to think about work until Monday. He had a portable phone himself and had wandered outside where he might find some privacy. It was Seth's turn to do the dinner dishes, and he heard about another plate hit the floor with crash. They're calling for fair weather tomorrow. Are they? That's handy. You can still drive up tonight. It was tempting, but she already given in to many impulses where he was concerned. I'll be there early enough in the morning. I don't suppose you have a bikini. A red one. She tucked her cheek in, tongue in cheek. No, I don't. Mine's blue. He waited me. Don't forget to pack. If I pack, if I stay, I keep the key to the bedroom door. You were so strict. He watched an air sail over the water to a nest atop a marker, making for home, he thought, settling it. Just cautious, Quinn, and very smart. How's the building coming? Along. He murmured. He liked to hear her voice, filling the moist air, move watching the evening slide, you know, as a kiss over water trees. I'll show you when you're here. He wanted to show her Seth's sketch. He framed it himself that afternoon and wanted to share it with someone who mattered. <laughs> we'll probably get started on the first boat next week. Really? That quick? Well, I wait. It's time to put our money down and see how the dice fall. I've been feeling lucky lately. From the house, behind him, he heard the puppy bark madly, followed by Simon's deeper tones, then Philip's voice, raising a half shout, half laughing, echoed by the rarely heard sound of Seth's giggle, made him turn, stare at the house. The back door opened, and the two canine forms bulleting out, tumbling over each other as they reached the steps. And there, framed in the doorway with the kitchen light washing, washing thoroughly, was a boy grinning. Whatever pulled a cam's heart pulled hard. For a moment, just one wild moment, he thought he heard the crack creak of the porch rocker his father's low chuckle jesus is weird he mumbled the connection began to waver and crack while he walked. what everything he found himself gripping the phone tighter he under fur with a wild almost desperate desire you should be here i miss you i can't hear you he realized he'd been stepping away from the house kind of knee jerked and all the sensations of being drawn in coming home settling in I'll shake of his head he walked back on until the connection cleared. Thank God for the vagueness of technology. I said, what are you wearing? She laughed softly, looking down at her baggy, practical sweats. Why, nothing much. She purred. Both of them fell into the ease of phone flirting with various sensations of relief. A short time later, Cam set the phone on the porch steps and wandered down to the dock. Water lapping gently against the hull of the boat. Night birds were stirring. The deep two-tone call of an owl in the woods beyond led the chorus. The sea was ink dark under the fragile light of a thumbnail moon. There was work to do. New Ethan would be waiting for him, but he needed to sit there by the water for a moment, to sit in the quiet while stars winked on and the owl called endlessly, patiently, for its mate.
He didn't jump when he saw the movement beside him. He was getting used to it. <laughs> Couldn't count the times he sat on this same dock under the same sky with his father. It occurred to him that it was probably a little different to sit here with his father's ghost. But what the hell? Nothing about his life was the same as it once had been. I knew you were here. Cam said quietly. I like to keep an eye on things. Ray dressed in fisherman's pants. And the short sleeve sweatshirt that Cam remembered had once been bright blue. Dangled a line in the water. Been a while since I did any night fishing. Cameron decided that if Ray pulled up a wriggling catfish, most likely send him over the thin edge of sanity. How close an eye? He asked, thinking of Anna, just what Susan did in the dark. Ray sure. I always respect my boy's privacy, Cam. Don't you worry about that. She sure is a looker, he said lightly. She tries to cover it up when she's working, but a man with a good eye can see through it. He always had a good eye for the ladies. How about you? Cam hated himself for asking. It was such a peaceful night, such a perfect one, but he never knew how long these visitations, hallucinations, whatever they were, would last. He had to ask, How was your eye for the ladies, Dad? Sharp enough. Landed on your mother, didn't it? I'm really sorry. I never touched another woman after I made my vows to Stella. Cam, I looked. I appreciated. I enjoyed. But I never touched. You have to tell me about that. I can't. It's not the way it has to be. You did a good thing by the boy making him part of the business. You're starting by using his jaws. He needs to feel that he's part of things. I wish I had more time with him, with all of you. That's not the way it has to be either. Dad, you know what I miss, Cam? The silliest things. Watching the three of you argue over something. There were times when your mother and I thought you'd bicker us crazy. But I miss that now. An early morning fishing when the sun just starts to burn off the mist over the winter water. I miss teaching. I miss seeing that look on a student's face when something you say, just one thing, clicks and opens the mind. I miss pretty girls in summer dresses and lie in bed at 3 o'clock in the morning, listening to the rain on the roof. Then he turned his head and smiled. His eyes were as bright and brilliant and blue as the sweatshirt he had once been. You should appreciate those things while you have them, but you never do. Not all the way. Too busy living. Now and again, you should try to stop to appreciate the little things. They'll build up if you do. I've got a little more on my mind than the rain on the roof right now. I know. You've got a mess on your hands, but you're sorting it. You've still got to figure out what you want and what you need and what's inside you. You've got more in there than you think. I want answers. I need answers. You'll find them. Ray said complacently. When you slow down, tell me this. Do either of them know you're... Here. They will. They smile again. Smile again. When it's time for it, should be a nice day for sale tomorrow. Enjoy the little thanks. He said and faded away. End of chapter 16.